Hi, everybody. <clears throat> it's Greg Swanson. It's January 12th, 2022, in the middle of winter here. It's like super cold, dark, early, and the days are long. And so what happens this time of year in Minnesota? We go to read books. So it's book review time, and the book I'm reading is The Forgotten Soldier by a guy named Guy Sager, right? Very interesting book fascinating I just finished reading it they said on the back cover that this was like a missing account of World War II yeah that's probably a pretty apt description of this book why because I mean I'm 51 what do you know about World War II Germany Adolf Hitler bunch of jackasses right I mean the concentration camps all that stuff kind of comes to mind right you know that Germany was evil, they were horrible, there's tons of movies, there's tons of books, there's tons of stories about how horrible Germany was. And here we have a book called The Forgotten Soldier by Guy Sager, who was a German soldier. All right, okay, so uh, one of the points that he makes in the book is that the victors get to write the stories about history and war kind of an interesting perspective. We are supposed to believe one thing, and it's easy to believe the narrative that gets handed down. And so I have to kind of tip my hat to this guy who was a kid in World War II, okay? Now, pay attention to this kid's background. He's an Alsacian. He's from the Alsace-Lorraine region of Europe. It's in between France and Germany, right? It's a contested region. The French think it's theirs. The Germans think it's theirs. That's kind of been how it's looked at or the issue with Alsace-Lorraine. Well, he grows up in this part of Europe and his mother is German and his father is French. Okay, so he's a mixed breed, right? Off the bat. I mean, this guy doesn't have it going for him. And so he grows up, he speaks French and German. So you know how powerful the Germans were in the early part of World War II. They rolled through that area and they conscripted and he joined, right? And so he was a uh, he he was like, Yeah, I want to join the German army. I wanna like fight Bolshevism. And that was the philosophy that he believed was the right uh, thing to uh, adhere to because that's what he was taught. Now, how much do you know when you're 17 years old? You know, I mean, I've had 17 year olds. They don't know much, right? They know a lot, but they don't know much. And so here he is as a 17 year old believing what's going on, believing the narrative. Uh, and he, he joins the German army, ends up in Russia, fights for three years in Russia in the freezing cold. <laughs> I mean, it is cold, okay? So now think about this guy. He's 17 years old. He's in a supply unit. He is supplying goods to Stalingrad, which on the way there to supply them with material, they learn that Stalingrad has fallen, right? Like Paulus, Field Marshal Paulus surrenders the whole sixth army right at Stalingrad and then on the way they learn about this and they turn around and they have to get new orders okay so what happens on the way to Stalingrad where they end up stopping is that they from that point on start to fight a rear guard action they start to fight against the what they call the Red Army the Russians the Germans fight against the Russians and the Russians advance slowly across Siberia and the Ukraine and Eastern Europe all the way into Germany, right? And um, this guy, Guy Sager, he is fighting in his unit this kind of like a, 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 a battle in retreat for three years, right? That's kind of what he does, all right? so. Again, he starts out, he's 17 years old. He's in the middle of these two philosophies. You got Adolf Hitler on the one side, remember? he Adolf Hitler in Germany, National Socialism, their philosophy is, has this virulent strain of anti-Semitism, right? And also a virulent anti-Bolshevism. Bolshevism is the uh, communist Marxist form of government that emerges 
1917 in Russia. So the, 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 the Germans hate the Bolsheviks, the Russians, because the Bolsheviks and the Russians, they're communists, right? And uh, the Russians end up hating the Germans because the Germans invade Russia and they pretty much just flatten it, right? And it's just total war. Well, that's what we know. But when you read this book, and it's a thick book, and from a 17-year-old kid's perspective, he writes it like 10 or 15 years later, he writes this book. When you read this book, you realize that this is a kid with some friends in a, in a very efficient, very organized military environment. And there's certain traits to the German army that come through in this book that are like kind of the, the things that we think about, right? The German army is hyper efficient, super regulated, I mean, prone to extreme organization, right? And uh, kind of throughout it all, there's this theme of extreme obedience, right? So if there's ever any disobedience, I mean, it's like dealt with in the harshest possible terms. One of the guys in this book, um, one of guy's buddies, um, they're just starving one day, right? Because there's just no rations, there's no supply, there's no food. And they come across this overturned car and they're like digging in the car for food and they find food and the military police come on and snatch the two, two of the guys in their group and hang them for uh, thievery, right? And they're starving to death, right? So, I mean, it was the, the, the danger to this guy and his friends was not only from battle, right, against the Russians, but from their own, just the extreme order and discipline that, that the military police also brought to bear on the Wehrmacht, right, the regular German army. All right, so what are the things that I, I could take away from this book? He's got two, he's got a bunch of buddies, but he's got two that kind of stand out. One is Hals, H-A-L-S, that's his like best friend. He's kind of this mountain of a man, another teenager. And they kind of go through these three years together and Hals kind of keeps him alive, right? And another buddy that they hang out with is like 10 or 15 years older than both of them and they call him the veteran, right? His name is, Viner in the in the book and the veteran has has been on previous campaigns knows how to fight he's kind of like ahead of the game mentally and as a soldier he ends up keeping this unit and these young teenagers alive throughout all of these rear guard campaigns that they're fighting okay and so um uh these two these two guys Hals and Viner kind of are the key pieces in this book, right? And so I'm gonna read a little bit about this book because it kind of punches you a little bit right in the nose how he writes about war. Okay, I'm picking it up here on page 222. The Red Army was moving toward us from Cherkasy in the east and the Dnieper in the west. To the north, they had crossed the Desna, and a large number of our troops were trapped at the confluence of the Desna and the Dnieper. Winter had begun, and with the falling snow, a deep feeling of despair settled over us. We were exhausted and had no hope of future respite. Where could we find it? How far would we have to withdraw? To the Pripet? The bug? The odor? The veteran grinned sardonically. That seemed impossible unimaginable. And the reason that seems impossible is because the Germans can never imagine mentally, they couldn't couldn't fathom it up here, that the Russians would cross the entirety of the uh, of the Ukraine and, and, and come across all of Central Europe and then invade into Germany. They couldn't they couldn't imagine that. And so the veteran is making a joke and he's saying, no, they're going to come all the way to the Oder, which is this boundary river in Eastern Europe. One can only draw a very general view of our situation from the lines I've just written without any of the details. I'm not trying to recreate precise geographic chronologies of the Russo-German War, but to give an account of the almost inconceivable difficulties we faced. I have never had more than a very approximate idea of our movements and centers of operation and would certainly be incapable of drawing an accurate diagram. That is the province of the various disbanded staffs. 
I, on the other hand, can describe certain moments down to the last detail. A simple smell can revive a whole tragic past for me and leave me for long stretches of time wrapped in memory and lost to the present. I know in my bones what our watchword courage means, from days and nights of resigned desperation and from the insurmountable fear which one continues to accept, even though one's brain has ceased to function normally. I know what it means remembering deliberate immobility against frozen soil, whose coldness penetrates to the marrow of the bones and the howling of a stranger in the next hole. I know that one can call on all the saints in heaven for help without believing in any God, and it is this that I must describe, even if it means plunging back into a nightmare for nights at a time, for that is the substance of my task, to reanimate with all the intensity I can summon those distant cries from the slaughterhouse. Too many people learn about war with no inconvenience to themselves. They read about Verdun or Stalingrad without comprehension, sitting in a comfortable armchair with their feet bes beside the fire, preparing to go about their business the next day as usual. One should really read such accounts under compulsion, in discomfort, considering oneself fortunate not to be describing the events in a letter home, writing from a hole in the mud. One should read about war in the worst circumstances, when everything is going badly, remembering that the torments of peace are trivial and not worth any white hairs. Nothing is really serious in the tranquility of peace. Only an idiot can be, could be really disturbed by a question of salary. One should read about war standing up late at night when one is tired, as I am writing about it now, at dawn, while my asthma, wear, asthma attack wears off, and even now in my sleepless exhaustion, how gentle and easy peace seems. Holy cow. I mean, that's, that's tough. Like, I'm, I, I read this book laying down, sitting in my armchair, just like he's saying I shouldn't. I didn't go outside and stand up in the middle of the night and read this book under compulsion or, you know what I mean, in the cold. He's saying that his life was so measure, so hard. At one point in the book, he says, our brains and emotions had just liquefied. We couldn't obey. We couldn't do anything. We couldn't move. We were so physically, emotionally, spiritually drained of absolutely everything. And they were emaciated to boot. It's amazing that this guy even survived. Because he ends up in this city called Mehmet, right, which has been renamed since this time. It's a port city that there were ex-filling civilians out of because when the Russian army came across, they were so furious that the Germans had invaded and torched their country. They were so mad that they just came through and just leveled um, everything that had anything to do with Germany, right? And so when they hit Prussia, um, they were they would just like roll, steamroll everything over and nobody had any recourse. The civilian population was told there's two choices basically. You either escape or you're gonna die, right? The Russians don't care. Because they the, the the Russians had one thing in mind and that was revenge because of how poorly they had been treated by the Germans. And so he finds himself with his group um, trying to uh, provide military cover for the civilians of Mehmet to exfil out of there through the seaport, right? And he ends up down uh, on, on, on the beaches, on sand. And, um, and he ends up like completely like uh, unable to move anymore. He's out of food. He's out of, he just, him and his buddies are just, they're gassed. They're done. They, they can't go anymore. And they're on the beach and they're ready to just die. And at that moment, this boat comes up, and it's a German transport ship, military transport ship, and they're calling out, is anybody here? And in that moment, they, like, haul themselves up onto this boat and get out of there. And then from there, they get, um, they, they fight more <laughs> and more battles, but they end up getting, um, uh, getting orders to go back to uh, Germany. And so they go back to Germany by way of Denmark and end up 
if you can believe this, been fighting for three years uh, on the Eastern Front against Russia. Like in the last two weeks, they're on the Western part of, of, of Germany and they surrender to some British troops, right? And so the British troops then keep them as prisoners for like a few weeks and his time ends up where he gets interrogated and they find out that he's an Alsacian. He's half French. And they find out when he joined and why he joined and 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 then they transferred him, I think, to like a, a French uh, uh, officer to talk to. And the French officer was like, so you live over there and your mom is German and your dad is French? And, the, and he explains everything and he says, okay, well, you're, you're going home. My advice to you is forget all about this as fast as you possibly can and then join the French army so that you have a story to tell. You want to be able to tell the story that you were part of the French army and not the German army, right? So he ends up going home. It's a miracle that he survives this, right? Because in the book, there's so many times he should have been dead. He ends up going home into his village in, in Alsace-Lorraine, right? And he's walking to his house. This is interesting. He's walking to his house and there's a civilian plane that comes flying over, over the town. And as he's walking on the road to his house, this plane comes flying over. He hurls himself into, into, onto the side of the road, on, down the shoulder, right? To protect himself from getting shot or bombed, right? So this guy's instincts were so in charge of him after living through this shell-shocked environment of being at war for three years continuously um, that, you know, he gets up, dusts himself off, and then he sees his mom walking on the street to go get some milk, and he waits for her to come back, and then he says, Mom, and she recognizes that it's him. She almost faints, you know, takes him. And she he, They walk back together. And then, um, and then he, he he's basically home at that time, but his parents forbid him to ever talk about any of his experiences. They're just like, you can never say anything. And uh, and then you know he he you can imagine he's desperate to and but he he joins the French army, and anecdotally at the end it's kind of interesting um, because he said that he had to like not be first at everything you know in the French army. Um, because he was, I don't know, was probably such a skilled soldier, but then he gets sick and he has to come back home. And it, later in life, he ends up becoming a cartoonist, right? Um, a fascinating book. Why? Because in reading this book, it, it augments our perspective of World War II. It augments our perspective of war and what happens to people in war. Because we think... I think sometimes in terms of the titanic struggle between the cult of personality of Adolf Hitler over here with, you know, Nazi socialism, and then Joseph Stalin over here with, right, Marxism and Leninism, communism and all that. And these totalitarian struggles that are just like, just roll over everybody, don't care about anybody and just kind of slaughter the masses of humanity. And then you end up with a kid, a 17-year-old kid, in the middle of that on one side of it, which is the side that we see as horrible. And and he's just, he never talks about Jews. You know, he never talks about anti-Semitism. He never talks about um, kind of the horrors of what we understand as Nazism, right? He talks about... Um, believing in fighting against Bolshevism, which is communism. That's what informed his 17-year-old brain. And um, it, 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 he talks a lot about his friends, right? And at the end, or at the, actually at the beginning, the preface, I'll read this real quickly. He asks himself, Guy Sager, who are you? He says, my parents were country people born some hundreds of miles apart, a distance filled with difficulties, strange complexities, jumbled frontiers, and sentiments which were equivalent but untranslatable, right? Talking about the German and the French thing. I was produced by this alliance, straddling this delicate combination with one life to live to deal with its manifold problems. I was a child, but that is without significance. The problems I had existed before I did, and I discovered them. 
Then there was war, and I married it because there was nothing else when I reached the age of falling in love. What a bummer that is, man. I had to shoulder a brutally heavy burden. Suddenly, there were two flags for me to honor. Let me... The Siegfried and the Maginot, the, and powerful external enemies. I entered the service, dreamed, and hoped. I also knew cold and fear in places never seen by a Lily Marlene. A day came when I should have died, and after that, nothing seemed important. So I've stayed as I am without regret, separated from the normal human condition. It's almost like he describes himself as a little bit of a ghost, almost a zombie, right? After having lived through what he did. Um, and and uh, I just, I do, at the end of the book, I have sympathy for this man. I do. Um, I don't look him as, as, a, as a terrorist or a horrible guy. I'm glad he survived. And I'm glad he actually had the guts to share the perspective because... Even 15 years later, writing a book about his experience was not a popular thing to do. I think I, I read somewhere that he lost his job when he published his manuscript. So get the book, The Forgotten Soldier by Guy Sager. It's a gutsy, tough read. It took me like three weeks to get through this thing. But read the book. It's awesome. You're going to like it. You're going to learn a lot about kind of what was going on at that time. And you will learn a lot about the state of Germany and the state of Russia um, from his perspective. So fantastic.